Let's talk about this elephant in the brain. Uh, amazing book. The elephant in the room is, quote, an important issue that people are reluctant to acknowledge or address a social taboo. The elephant in the brain is an important but unacknowledged feature of how our mind works, an introspective taboo. You describe selfishness and self-deception as uh, the core or some of the core elephants, as some of the elephants, elephant offspring in the brain, selfishness and self-deception. All right, can you explain? Can you explain why these are um, the taboos in our brain that we uh, so don't want to acknowledge to ourselves? Your conscious mind, yes. the one that's listening to me that I'm talking to at the moment, Allegedly. you like to think of yourself as the president or king of your mind, ruling over all that you see, issuing commands that immediately obeyed. Yes, you are instead better understood as the press secretary of your brain. You don't make decisions. You justify them to an audience. That's what your conscious mind is for. <laughs> yeah. You watch what you're doing put, and put. you try to come up with stories that explain what you're doing so that you can avoid accusations of violating norms. So yes. humans compared to most other animals have norms and this allows us to manage larger groups with our morals and norms about what we should or shouldn't be doing. This is so important to us that we needed to be constantly watching what we were doing in order to make sure we had a good story to avoid norm violations. So many norms are about motives. So mm -hmm. if I hit you on purpose, that's a big violation. If I hit you accidentally, that's okay. I need to be able to explain why it was an accident and not on purpose. Uh, so where does that need come from for your own self-preservation? Right, so humans have norms and we have the norm that if we see anybody violating a norm, we need to tell other people and then coordinate to, to describe make them stop and yes. punish them for, for violating. So such punishments are strong enough and severe enough that we each want to avoid being successfully accused of violating norms. Mm -hmm. So for example, hitting someone on purpose is a big clear norm violation. If we do it consistently, we will, may be thrown out of the group and that would mean we would die. That's right. Okay, so we need to be able to convince people we are not going around hitting people on purpose. <laughs> if somebody happens to be at the other end of our fist and their face, connects, that was an accident, and we need to be able to explain that. <laughs> and similarly for many other norms humans have, uh, we are serious about these norms and we don't want people to violate them. We find them violating, we're going to accuse them. But many norms have a motive component, and so we are trying to explain ourselves and make sure we have a good motive story about everything we do, which is why we're constantly trying to explain what we're doing, and that's what your conscious mind is doing. It is trying to make sure you've got a good motive story for everything you're doing. And that's why you don't know why you really do things. What you know is what the good story is about why you've been doing things. And that's the self-deception. And you're saying that there is a machine, the actual dictator is selfish. And then you're just the press secretary who's desperately doesn't want to get fired and is justifying all of all of the decisions of the dictator. And that's the self-deception. Right, now, most people actually are willing to believe that this is true in the abstract. So our book has been classified as psychology and it was reviewed by psychologists. And the basic way that psychology referees and reviewers responded is to say, this is well known. Most people accept that there's a fair bit of self-deception. But they that, don't want to accept it about themselves directly. Well, they don't want to accept it about the particular topics that we talk about. So people accept the idea in the abstract that they might be self-deceived or that they might not be honest about various things. But that hasn't penetrated into the literatures where people are explaining particular things like why we go to school, why we go to the doctor, why we vote, et cetera. So our book is mainly about 10 areas of life and explaining about in each area, what our actual motives there are. And you know, people who study those things have not admitted that hidden motives are explaining those particular areas. So they haven't taken the leap from theoretical psychology to actual public policy. Exactly. And economics and all that kind of stuff. Well, let me just linger on this uh, and uh, bring up my old friends, uh, Zygmunt Freud and Carl Jung. So how vast is this? Uh, landscape of the unconscious mind, the power and the scope of the dictator. Is uh, is it only dark there? Is it uh, some light? Is there some love? The vast majority of what's happening in your head, you're unaware of. 
So in a literal sense, the unconscious, the aspects of your mind that you're not conscious of is the overwhelming majority. That, But that's just true in a, in a literal engineering sense. <laughs> your mind is doing lots of low-level things, and you just can't be consciously aware of all that low-level stuff. But there's plenty of room there for lots of things you're not aware of. Mm -hmm. But can we try to shine a light at the things we're unaware of, specifically, now again, staying with the philosophical psychology side for a moment, you know, can you shine the light in the Jungian shadow? Can you, what, what's going on there? What is this machine like? Like what, what level of thoughts are happening there? Is it uh, something that could, we can even interpret, if we somehow could visualize it, is it something that's human interpretable or is it just a kind of chaos of like monitoring different systems in the body, making sure you're happy, making sure you're um, fed, all those kind of basic forces that form abstractions on top of each other and they're not introspective at all. We humans are social creatures. Mm -hmm. Plausibly being social is the main reason we have these unusually large brains. Therefore, most of our brain is devoted to being social. And so the things we are very obsessed with and constantly paying attention to are, how do I look to others? <laughs> What would others think of me if they knew these various things they might learn about me? So that's close to being fundamental to what it means to be human, is caring what others think. Right, to, to be trying to present a story that would be okay for what others think, but we're very constantly thinking, what do other people think? <laughs> so let me ask you this question then about you, Robin Hansen, who m m many places sometimes for fun, sometimes as a basic statement of principle, likes to disagree with what with, with, with the majority of people think. Um, so how do you explain, um, how are you self-deceiving yourself in this task? And how are you being self, how's your, like why is the dictator manipulating you inside your head to be self-critical? Like there's norms, why do you wanna stand out? in this way? Why do you want to challenge the norms in this so, way? Almost by definition, I can't tell you what I'm deceiving myself about, but the more practical strategy that's quite feasible is to ask about what are typical things that most people deceive themselves about and then to own up to those particular things. Sure. What, what's, so, a, what's, a, what's a good one? <laughs> so for example, I can very much acknowledge that I would like to be well thought of. Yes. <laughs> that I would be seeking a uh, attention and glory and uh, praise yes. from my intellectual work and that that would be a major agenda driving my intellectual attempts. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if there were topics that other people would find less interesting, I might be less interested in those for that reason, for example. I might want to find topics where other people are interested and I might want to um, go for the glory of finding a big insight rather than a small one. Mm -hmm and maybe one that was especially surprising. That's also, of course, consistent with some more ideal concept of what an intellectual should be. But most intellectuals are relatively risk averse. They are in some local intellectual tradition and they are adding to that and they are staying conforming to the sort of usual assumptions and usual accepted beliefs and practices of a particular area so that they can be accepted in that area and, you know, treated as part of the community. Um, but you might think for the purpose of the larger intellectual project of understanding the world better, people should be less eager to just add a little bit to some tradition and they should be looking for what's neglected between the major traditions and major questions. They should be looking for assumptions maybe we're making that are wrong. They should be looking at ways, things that are very surprising, like things that would be uh, you would have thought a priori unlikely that once you are convinced of it, you find that to be very important and uh, and, and a big update, right? So um, you could say that um, one motivation I might have is less motivated to be sort of comfortably accepted into some particular intellectual community and more willing to just go for these more fundamental long shots that should be very important if you could find them. Which would, if if you can find them, would get you Attention. appreciated, uh, respect uh, across a larger number of people across the longer time span of history. Right. So, like maybe the sh the small local community will say you suck. Uh, right. You must conform, 
but the larger community will see the brilliance of you breaking out of the cage of the small conformity into right. a larger cage. It's always <laughs> a bigger, there's always a bigger right. cage and then you'll be remembered by more. Yeah. Um, also that explains your choice of colorful shirt that looks great <laughs> in a black background. So you definitely stand out. Right. Our, uh, now, of course, you know, you could say, well, you could get all this attention by making false claims of sure. dramatic improvement. Sure. And then wouldn't that be much easier than actually working through all the details? Why not? To make true claims, Let right? Let me ask the press secretary, <laughs> why not? Why? So, of course, you spoke several times about how much you value truth and the pursuit of truth. That's a very nice narrative. Right. Hitler and Stalin also talked about the value of truth. Do you worry when you introspect, as broadly as all humans might, that it becomes a drug? This uh, being a martyr, pointing, being the person who points out that the emperor wears no clothes, even when the emperor is obviously dressed, <laughs> <laughs> just to be the person who points yeah. out that the emperor is wearing no clothes. Do you think about that? <clears throat> So I think the, <laughs> the standards perfect. you hold yourself to are dependent on the audience you have in mind. So if you think of your audience as relatively easily fooled or relatively gullible, then you won't bother to generate more complicated, deep you know, arguments and structures and evidence wait, to wait persuade minute. somebody who has higher standards because why bother? Uh, you you can get away with something much easier. And of course, if you are, say, a salesperson, uh, you know, you make money on sales, then you don't need to convince the top few percent of the most sharp customers. You can just go for the yeah. bottom 60% of the most gullible customers and make plenty of sales, right? So I think um, intellectuals have to vary. One of the main ways intellectuals vary is in who is their audience in their mind? Who, who are they trying to impress? Is it the people down the hall? Is it the people who are reading their Twitter feed? Is it their parents? Is it their high school teacher? Right. Or is it Einstein and Freud and Socrates, right? So I think the, those of us who are especially arrogant, especially think that we're really big shot or have a chance at being a really big shot, we were naturally going to pick the the big shot audience that we can. We're going to be in, trying to impress Socrates and Einstein. Is that why you hang out with Tyler <laughs> Cohen a lot and try? Sure, I mean, <laughs> try to convince him, right? Stuff. You know, and you might think, you know, from the point of view of just making money or having sex or other sorts of things, this is misdirected energy, <laughs> right? Right. Trying to impress the very most highest quality minds—that's such a small sample, and they can't do that much for you anyway. Yeah. True. So I might well have had more, you know ordinary success in life, be more popular, invited to more parties, make more money if I had targeted a lower tier set of intellectuals with the standards they have. But yeah. for some reason, I decided early on that Einstein was my audience or people like him, and I was gonna impress them. Yeah, I mean, you you pick your set of motivations. Uh, you know, convincing, impressing Tyler Cohen is not gonna help you get laid, trust me, I tried. <laughs> All right, uh, <laughs> what are some notable um, sort of effects of the elephant in the brain in everyday life? So you mentioned when we try to apply that to economics, to public policy. So when we think about medicine, education, all those kinds of right. things, so the, what, the, what are some things that well, we Well, the key thing is medicine is much less useful health-wise than you think. So, you know, <laughs> if you were focused on your health, you would, care a lot less about it. And if you were focused on other people's health, you would also care a lot less about it. But if medicine is, as we suggest, more about showing that you care and let other people showing that they care about you, then a lot of priority on medicine can make sense. So that was our very earliest discussion in the podcast. You were talking about what, are you, you know, should you give people a lot of medicine when it's not very effective? And then the answer then is, well, if that's the way that you show that you care about them and you really want them to know you care, then maybe that's what you need to do if you can't find a cheaper, more effective substitute. So if we actually just pause on that for a little bit, um, how do we start to untangle the full set of self-deception happening in the space of medicine? So we have a, a method that we use in our book that is what I recommend for people to use in all these sorts of topics. The straightforward method is first, don't look at yourself. <laughs> 
Look at other people. Look at broad patterns of behavior in other people. And then ask, what are the various theories we could have to explain these patterns of behavior? And then just do the simple matching. Which theory better matches the behavior they have? Mm -hmm. And the last step is to assume that's true of you too. <laughs> Don't assume you're an exception. It may, if you happen to be an exception, that won't go so well. But nevertheless, on average, you aren't very well positioned to judge if you're an exception. So look at what other people do, explain what other people do, and assume that's you too. But also in the case of medicine, there's several parties to consider. So there's the individual person that's receiving the medicine. There's the doctors that are prescribing the medicine. Mm -hmm. There's um, drug companies that are selling drugs. There are governments that have regulations, there are lobbyists. So you, you can build up a network of categories of humans in this, mm -hmm. and they each play their role. So how do you introspect the sort of analyze the system at a system scale versus at the individual scale? So it, it turns out that in general, it's usually much easier to explain producer behavior than consumer behavior. That is the drug companies or the doctors have relatively clear incentives to give the customers whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> and similarly say go governments in democratic countries have the incentive to give the voters what they want. So uh, that focuses your attention on the patient and the voter in this equation and saying, what do they want? They would be driving the rest of the system. Uh, whatever they want, the other parties are willing to give them in order to get paid. Um, so now we're looking for puzzles in patient and voter behavior. What are they choosing and why do they choose that? And how much exactly? And then we can explain that potentially, again, returning to the producer, by the producer being incentivized to manipulate the decision-making processes of the voter and the consumer. Well, now, in almost every industry, producers are, in general, happy to lie <laughs> and exaggerate in order to get more customers. Yeah. This is true of auto repair as much as human body repair and medicine. So the differences between these industries can't be explained by the willingness of the producers to give customers what they want or to do various things that we have to, again, go to the customers. Why are customers treating body repair different than auto repair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that potentially requires a lot, a lot of thinking, a lot of data collection, and potentially looking at historical data too, because things don't just happen overnight. That over time, there's trends. In principle, it does, but actually, it's a lot actually easier than you might think. I think the biggest limitation is just the willingness to consider alternative hypotheses. So many of the patterns that you need to rely on are actually pretty obvious, simple patterns. You just have to notice them and ask yourself, how can I explain those? Often you don't need to look at the most subtle, most you know difficult statistical evidence that might be out there. The simplest patterns are often enough. All right, so there, there's a fundamental statement about self-deception in the book. There's the application of that, like we just did in medicine. Can you steel man the argument that uh, many of the foundational ideas in the book are wrong? <laughs> Meaning, uh, there's two that you've just made, which is it can be a lot simpler than it looks. Can you steel man the case that it's case by case, it's going, It's always super complicated. Like it's a complex system. It's very difficult to have a simple model about. It's very difficult to introspect. And the other one is that the human brain isn't not just about self-deception, um, that, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of motivations at play and we are able to really introspect our own mind. And like what what's on the surface of the conscious is actually quite a good representation of what's going on in the brain and you're not deceiving yourself. You're able to actually arrive to deeply think about where your mind stands and what you think about the world. And it's less about impressing people and more about being a free thinking individual. So <laughs> when a child um, tries to explain why they don't have their homework assignment, yes, they are sometimes inclined to say, the dog ate my homework. They almost never say, the dragon ate my homework. The reason is the dragon is a completely implausible explanation. Almost always when we make excuses for things, we choose things that are at least in some degree plausible. It could perhaps have happened. That's an obstacle for any explanation of a hidden motive or a hidden feature of human behavior. 
if people are pretending one thing while really doing another, they're usually going to pick as a pretense something that's somewhat plausible. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an obstacle to proving that hypothesis if you are focused on sort of the local data that a person would typically have if they were challenged. So if you're just looking at one kid and his lack of homework, yeah. maybe you can't tell whether his dog ate his homework or not. If you happen to know he doesn't have a dog, <laughs> you might have more confidence, right? You will need to have a wider range of evidence than a typical person would when they're encountering that actual excuse in order to see past the excuse. Uh, that will just be a general feature of this. So in order, if, if I say, you know, there's this usual story about where we go to the doctor and then there's this other explanation, you know, it'll be true that you'll have to look at wider data in order to see that because, you know, people don't usually offer excuses unless in the local context of their excuse, they can get away with it. That is, it's, it's hard to tell, right? So in the case of medicine, I have to point you to sort of larger sets of data. But in many areas of academia, including health economics, the researchers there also want to support the usual points of view. <laughs> and so they will have selection effects in their publications and their analysis whereby they, if they're getting a result too much contrary to the usual point of view everybody wants to have, they will file drawer that paper <laughs> or redo the analysis until they get an answer that's more to people's liking. So that means in the health economics literature, there are plenty of people who will claim that in fact, we have evidence that medicine is effective. And when I respond, I will have to point you to our most reliable evidence <laughs> and ask you to consider the possibility that the literature is biased in that when the, when the evidence isn't as reliable, when they have more degrees of freedom in order to get the answer they want, they do tend to get the answer they want. But when we get to the kind of evidence that's much harder to mess with, that's where the that's where we will see the truth be more revealed. So with respect to medicine, we have millions of papers published in medicine over the years, most of which give the impression that medicine is useful. There's a small literature on randomized experiments of the aggregate effects of medicine, where there's you know maybe a few half dozen or so papers <laughs> where it would be the hardest hardest to hide it because it's such a straightforward experiment done in a straightforward way that um, you know it's hard to manipulate. And that's where I will point you to, to show you that there's relatively little correlation between health and medicine. But even then, people could try to save the phenomenon and say, well, it's not hidden motives, it's just ignorance. They could say, for example, you know, medicine's complicated, most people don't know the literature, uh, therefore uh, they can be excused for, for ignorance. They are just ignorantly assuming that medicine is effective. It's not that they have some other motive that they're trying to achieve. And then I will have to do, you know, as with a conspiracy theory analysis, and I'm saying, well, like, how long has this misperception been going on? How consistently has it happened around the world and across time? And I would have to say, look, uh, you know, if we're talking about, say, a recent new product, like uh, Segway scooters or something, I could say not so many people have seen them or used them. Maybe they could be confused about their value. If we're talking about a product that's been around for thousands of years, used in roughly the same way all across the world, and we see the same pattern over and over again, this sort of ignorance mistake just doesn't work so well. It also is a question of how much of the self-deception is prevalent versus foundational. Because there's a kind of implied thing where it's foundational to human nature versus just a common pitfall. This this is this is a question I have. So like maybe maybe human progress is made by people who don't fall into the self-deception. It's it's like a, it's sure. a baser aspect of human nature, but then you escape it easily if you if you're motivated. The motivational hypotheses about these self-deceptions are in terms of how it makes you look to the people around you. Again, the press secretary. Yes. So the story would be most people want to look good to the people around them. Therefore, most people present themselves in ways that help them look good to the people around them. That's sufficient to say there would be a lot of it. It doesn't need to be 100%, right? There's enough variety in people and in circumstances that sometimes taking a contrarian strategy can be in the interest of some minority of the people. So I might, for example, say that that's a strategy I've taken. <laughs> 
I've decided that uh, being contrarian on these things could be winning for me, mm -hmm. and that there's a room for a small number of people like me who have uh, these sort of messages who can then get more attention, even if there's not room for most people to do that. And uh, that can be explaining sort of the variety, right? So similarly, you might say, look, just look at the most obvious things. Most people would like to look good, right? In the sense of physically, just you look good right now. You're wearing a nice suit. You have a haircut. You shaved, right? So, and we have my own hair, by the way. <laughs> okay. Well, then, so all that, the more that, impressive. That's a counter. Uh, <laughs> that's a car counter argument for your claim. Right. Now, most clearly, people want to look good. So clearly, if we look at most people and their physical appearance, clearly most people are trying to look somewhat nice, right? They, yeah. they shower, they they shave, they comb their hair. But we certainly see some people around who are not trying to look so nice, right? Is that a Big challenge, the hypothesis that people want to look nice, not, not that much, right? We, we can see in the, those particular people's context more particular reasons why they've chosen to be an exception to the more general rule. So the general rule does reveal something foundational generally. 